Hello and welcome back. In today's video, I will be sharing with you the story of my very first stock market investment. When we start investing in the stock market, generally most of us are unaware of how the stock market works and most of the time we end up making mistakes. So the purpose of sharing this story is to share with you some of the mistakes I made when I started my investing journey. But I also want to share how it helped me formulate my investing style. So the video will be divided into three parts. In part one, I will share the story of my very first investment. In part two, I will discuss my top three ETFs right now and the reasons for holding them, which will lead us to part three, where I will further discuss my investing strategy and how some of my early experiences helped shape it. Also, before we get started, I do want to mention that the response for the past couple of videos has been amazing. I am working on the next video where I will be comparing covered call ETFs focused on the NASDAQ 100 index and technology stocks in general. But now let's get started with this video. Growing up, I knew nothing about the stock market. In fact, Prior to me, no one in my family had ever invested in the stock market. And the only reason I bothered investing was because I had overheard a few colleagues at work who bragged about making a good chunk of money trading stocks. This was back in 2017 and the stock they were bragging about was Amazon. 2017 had been a very good year for Amazon during which time it had gained around 43%. So with my mind made up, the first thing I did was open a brokerage account, which was the easiest part. But the difficult part was to decide what to invest in. Before risking my money on any stock, I had done some homework, which was limited to understanding the difference between investing and trading. So it wasn't much preparation, but I had at least got my approach right. Between trading and investing, I was more interested in investing which is a long-term approach where you hold the stock for at least one year. I realized that trading is a lot more work and is more like an active job, whereas investing is a more passive way of making money. And a lot of times, if the stock goes up like Amazon had done in 2017, then you actually end up making a lot more money through investing than you would with trading. At the same time, I wasn't too keen on investing in Amazon, even though it was a very popular stock at the time. I figured that the stock had already gone up a lot that year, and I did not see it going up anymore, at least not enough to give me a substantial profit. So I was looking for an alternative to Amazon, and one Canadian stock which caught my attention was Shopify. Launched in 2015, Shopify had become quite a popular stock on the Canadian stock market. Article after article I read praised Shopify as the next major stock and there were often comparisons with Amazon. So it was a no-brainer for me that Shopify would be a good investment. Remember, this was before the 10 to 1 stock split that happened in 2022. So the prices I'll be showing you on the screen are before the split. I had purchased 50 shares at an approximate price of 130 Canadian dollars per share. So my total investment was 6,500 Canadian dollars. For about a month after the purchase, the stock did extremely well. Its price went as high as $150 per share, growing my 6,500 Canadian dollars investment to a value of 7,500 Canadian dollars. But then something happened which was nothing short of a nightmare. A report was published by a firm called Citron Research, which was led by the short seller Andrew Left. This report allegedly implied that Shopify did not have any real business and a lot of its customers were just regular people trying to build a business online whose business never really got going. According to the research, Shopify's growing list of customers was inconsequential because a lot of those customers weren't well-established businesses but people simply looking to do a side hustle. It concluded that a lot of these customers would eventually cancel their subscription, causing Shopify to lose revenue in the future. This was quite shocking to me, but at the same time, it was very plausible. After all, Shopify's business model was to help brick and mortar stores 
build an online presence. But what if the vast majority of its customers were simply people looking to make some extra money online using a combination of dropshipping and Shopify's website building capabilities? Also, this was the first time I came across the idea of a short seller where a person could sell the stock they do not own at a higher price and then buy it back at a lower price to make profit. Until this time, I did not know that such a trade was even possible in the stock market. Anyways, as soon as this research was published, the sentiment in the stock market changed and became very negative about Shopify. The stock price began to plummet and when it reached 120 Canadian dollars per share, I panicked. Down 500 Canadian dollars and with the threat of the stock price going down even further, I decided it was time to sell. Now that I look back at it, I realize it was a very stupid decision. But then, at the time, I had not yet developed the ability to digest this kind of volatility. In my mind, if the stock price was going down, it simply meant that it would keep going down forever. And similarly, if the stock price was going up, I would assume it would keep going up forever. This was just the kind of rookie mindset that a lot of people start out with and end up making mistakes and losing money. Fortunately for me, I sold my shares at $120 per share and was able to get back $6,000 Canadian dollars with a loss of $500, which wasn't really a huge loss, all things considered. So this is how my very first stock market investment ended. I had originally intended it to be a long-term investment. However, given my panic, I ended up selling it within a couple of months. Nonetheless, this trade was quite significant in my investing journey because over time, keeping this trade in mind, I was able to learn a good number of things which have helped me develop a more robust and thorough approach at investing. So let us now discuss some of the lessons I learned from this experience, how it has impacted my investing strategy and also take a look at my top three holdings. So here are my top three holdings. As you can see, together they constitute a little over 60% of my total portfolio. Now let me begin by first explaining my rationale behind investing in each of these three ETFs. Starting with GLCC, which is the Global X Gold Producers Equity Covered Call ETF. Historically speaking, gold has always been a safe investment regardless of what is happening in the world. Also, the fact that the US economy has been struggling since the pandemic and the inflation has been a major problem in both US and Canada. I have a feeling that gold is going to be a lucrative investment in the coming years. To be honest, I regret that I did not invest more in this ETF because it has actually been a surprisingly very profitable investment, not only in terms of the income I'm receiving, but also in terms of capital gains. My average buy price is around $21 per share. So based on my cost basis, I am receiving a yield of over 12% annually. And in terms of capital gains, I am up about 30%. Not bad for a relatively less popular ETF. Next up, EQCL is probably a no brainer. EQCL is the all equity asset okay. allocation covered call ETF, again from GlobalX. This ETF is basically the equivalent of VEQT or XEQT with the addition of covered call strategy. It covers every stock across the globe. In other words, your risk is spread across multiple countries and multiple industries, and it can't get safer than that. My average buy price for this one is around $21.5 per share. Based on its current distributions of 21 cents per share, on a monthly basis, I am yielding over 11% annually as per my cost basis. And also in terms of capital gains, I am up about 1.5%. The third and the big one, YTSL, which is the Tesla Yield Shares Purpose ETF, might surprise some of you. Unlike EQCL and GLCC, this is not exactly a safe investment. It could either give outsized return or heavily underperform. 
And that is precisely why I have it as almost 30% of my portfolio holding. Not to mention its significant higher yield also helps boost the overall yield of my portfolio. My average purchase price of this ETF is around $23 per share. And based on its current payout of 30 cents per share on a monthly basis, I'm yielding over 15% annually as per my cost basis. In terms of capital gains, it is actually not a very happy story since based on its most recent price, I'm down about 20%. In the past, this would have been a cause of concern, but now it does not bother me anymore. Here, I want to highlight how my investment in Shopify as well as some other failures over the years have helped me develop my investing strategy. YTSL is the only high volatility ETF that I hold. All other ETFs are broad market index based funds, which provide stability to my overall portfolio in terms of the capital value. What I'm really doing over here is combining different approaches within my portfolio to give it more stability and also maximize income. Apart from growth and income based ETFs, I also buy dividend stocks whenever I come across an opportunity where a company's stock price has become quite cheap, either due to a bearish market sentiment or just a poor financial report. Two such stocks that I hold are CIBC and Enbridge, both of which are paying me over 7% yield based on my cost basis and have also grown in capital value. So you see, within my income-oriented portfolio, I have a growth-based fund like YTSL, I also have index-based fund like EQCL. I have a sector focus fund like GLCC. And in addition, I'm also value investing in individual stocks of high dividend paying companies whenever I see an opportunity such as with CIBC and Enbridge. When I started investing, I used to think that to be successful, you just need to focus on one specific strategy, such as if you want high growth, then it is best to buy only growth oriented stocks or if you are looking for income then it is best to just buy dividend paying stocks but now i combine a number of different approaches to build my portfolio and over time it has done quite well even though i'm down 20 percent on my ytsl etf my other holdings have been able to cover up those losses so my overall portfolio has never been down more than 10%, even during the worst of periods. In short, lesson number one is to combine different strategies to build your portfolio. Also, I'm okay with taking a slightly riskier position with YTSL, partly due to my age. I am in my mid thirties. So just in case YTSL does go down, because Tesla ends up not performing well over the next few years, I can still recover by investing in other more stable broad market ETFs. I have time on my side. In case I was in my mid 40s or 50s, then I would have used a safer approach by having EQCL as my top holding, with YTSL being less than 10% of my portfolio. So at least in my opinion, age is an important factor to consider when designing how risky you want your portfolio to be, and that would be the second lesson. Last but not the least, don't pay too much attention to outside noise. My biggest mistake with my investment in Shopify was the fact that I was heavily influenced by the short seller report, which in hindsight turned out to be incorrect. And since then, Shopify has become a major company. At the time, I failed to realize that the main purpose why the short seller released that negative report was to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt regarding Shopify stock so that its stock price would drop and he would be able to cover his short position at a profit. I am definitely not making that mistake again. For example, a common criticism that all covered call ETFs get is that they have high management expense ratios. This kind of criticism, while well-founded from the perspective of receiving maximum total return, often misses the point that these funds are designed to give the shareholders income upfront 
And the trade-off is that you will lose out on some of the total return in the long term. I'm not saying that we should turn a blind eye to all criticisms, but at the same time, it is important to understand why someone is making that criticism and if they have some underlying motive or if they simply do not understand the investment. In my experience, at least, I have found that there is mostly an underlying motive behind a criticism or the person making the criticism simply does not understand the goal of the investment. Hence, most of the time, shutting out the noise works out for the best. And with that, we come to the end of this video. Let me know in the comments section how you found this video and if you would like me to share more similar stories from my investing journey. I do have quite a few stories, especially from the pandemic. As always, views and opinions expressed in this video do not count as investment advice and always do your own due diligence before making any investment decision. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe if you found some value in this video. Thanks for watching. I will see you guys in the next one.